Daniel distinguished himself above the administrators and satraps because he had an extraordinary spirit. So the king planned to set him over the whole realm. The administrators and satraps, therefore, kept trying to find a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom, but they could find no charge or corruption, for he was trustworthy, and no negligence or corruption was found in him. Then these men said, We will never find any charge against this Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of his God. So the administrators and satraps went together to the king and said to him, May King Darius live forever. All the administrators of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, advisors, and governors have agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an edict that for 30 days, anyone who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den. Therefore, your majesty, establish the edict and sign the document so that as the law of the Medes and Persians, it is irrevocable and cannot be changed. So King Darius signed the written edict. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin and were saying, What are we going to do since this man is doing many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. One of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You're not considering that it is, it is to your advantage that one man should die for the people rather than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to unite the scattered children of God. So from that day on, they plotted to kill him. When Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house. The windows in its upstairs room opened toward Jerusalem, and three times a day, he got down on his knees, prayed, gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel, petitioning and imploring his God. So they approached the king and asked about his edict. Didn't you sign an edict that for 30 days, any person who petitions any God or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, as a law of the Medes and Persians, the order stands and is irrevocable. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He then said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is not possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. The stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation may not be changed. Then the king returned to his place and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and clothed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and were slapping his face. Pilate went outside again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know I find no grounds for charging him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the temple servants saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate responded, Take him and crucify him yourselves, since I find no grounds for charging him. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke with the king. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they haven't harmed me, for I was found innocent before him. And also before you, your majesty, I have not done harm. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, 
they came to the tomb, bringing the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Then King Darius wrote to those of every people, nation, and language who live on the whole earth. May your prosperity abound. I issue a decree that in all my royal dominion, people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. For he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Welcome to Easter Together. My name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors at Fellowship Church. So glad that you're joining us this morning. If you're watching this on your living room couch or at the kitchen table or wherever you might be, uh, we're thrilled that you're here. I want you to know that uh, I know this might feel a little bit strange, but you're not alone. As we've said already this morning, we're in this together. And today we are celebrating Jesus, the one who, through uh, his work on the cross and his resurrection, has brought us together. I'll admit it, this isn't easy uh, for any of us. Uh, earlier this week, my wife was on a video call in one room. I was on a video call in the other room. And next thing you know, we hear a scream because one of our sons has knocked a tooth out of the other son's mouth. That's what life has been like for us, and I know for many of you, uh, that's what it's been like. But I want us to just for a moment, if we could, take our eyes off our current circumstances and take our eyes off this current moment, which seems to grip us so tightly, and think about history. Today, we celebrate the story and the life and the history of a man who was once isolated from his friends and family who also was struck on the mouth. But today we celebrate Jesus as the most important person in human history, and we celebrate his resurrection as the most important event in human history. And we're doing so differently than we ever have. I know for many of us today we would have uh, prepared by you know, getting some Easter outfits together, maybe uh, having a family photo, and I'm sure some of you type A's, you're still gonna pull it off today. Uh, we would have gathered, most of us, for a grand Easter celebration at a church. The worship teams or the choirs, their, their energy would have been higher. There would have been an extra creative juice. The pastor would have done his best to preach his very best sermon. Maybe mom or grandma would have been preparing Easter dinner. And I want you to know that it's okay to miss those things. It's okay to, to wish those things were true. But I want to remind us this morning that those are not the things that make Easter, Easter. They're merely parts, they're accessories, they're how we celebrate, but they are not the reason that we celebrate. The church is not closed today. Doors to buildings may be closed, but the church isn't closed because the church is the people of God together, united by Jesus. And Easter is the story that matters. Long ago, there was a man named Daniel who understood that in a different sort of way. As we've said, uh, if you're joining us now in this series, we've been working through the book of Daniel. Uh, most of us would probably uh, anticipate on Easter Sunday a sermon from the New Testament, from one of the Gospels, from one of the accounts of the resurrection. But today, I want to remind many of us and, and maybe show some of us for the very first time that the Easter story, the gospel story, isn't merely part of the Bible, isn't merely part of God's story, but it is the story. 
It is what the whole thing is all about. If you look closely at familiar Old Testament scriptures, they're a bit like puzzles. And once you put all the pieces together, they show a picture of something that is to come, something marvelous and significant. And as our Zoom scripture reading show today, when you see Daniel chapter 6 and the beauty of this story that oftentimes gets relegated to children's stories or vacation Bible school, I'm not sure why, but we're going to talk about it today. When you read Daniel 6, the story of uh, Daniel in the lion's den, we're reminded of another story the grand story of the Bible itself. Daniel, a good man, is unjustly thrown into a pit designed for death. Jesus, the righteous Son of God, is betrayed by those closest to him and unjustly put on death row as well. Uh, Daniel is buried in a pit. Uh, A stone is rolled over, and a signet is there to say, hey, this is forever, that this is, this is the way it's supposed to end. Jesus absorbs the wrath of God for the sin of mankind on his back uh, on the cross, and then he's buried in a borrowed tomb, and the, stone, the, the tomb is set in place by a stone, and it's guarded securely because this is to be the end. But that's not how it ended. Daniel is uh, rescued from death in the pit of of the lions, and Jesus is resurrected to life in the resurrection. Darius, matter of fact, uh, <clears throat> he can't sleep. The Persian ruler runs to the lion's den the morning after Daniel had been buried there, and he wants to know, and he's hoping for hope that maybe Daniel has survived. And this is what he says. He says, at the first light of dawn, the king got up, and he hurried to the lion's den. When he reached the lion's den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue from the lions? And Daniel responds, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the lion's mouths and they haven't harmed me for I was found innocent before him. And also before you, your majesty, I have done no harm. In the aftermath of this incredible moment, Darius, the Persian ruler, makes this prophetic and unwittingly, uh, remarkably prophetic statement about Daniel's God. He says this, The king Darius, he wrote to those of every people and every nation and every language who lived on the whole earth, May your prosperity abound. I issue a decree that in all my royal dominion, people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. And listen to how Darius describes Daniel's God. He is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He rescues and he delivers He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth, and he has rescued Daniel from the power of lions. 500 years before the birth of Jesus, Darius, the Persian ruler, makes these declarations about Daniel's God that were also true of Jesus. Daniel, or excuse me, Darius declares of God, and this is true of Jesus, that Jesus lives, that Jesus reigns, and that Jesus rescues. Look closely with me at what he says in verse 26 of Daniel 6. Darius says, I issue a decree that in all my royal dominion, people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. More important than any news broadcast, any election result, any social media sensation is this news. Jesus lives. This is the greatest news that you and I can know today, and it certainly was in the uh, early part of Christianity. Matter of fact, the author of the New Testament book, Luke, he was a historian, and he carefully wrote down the circumstances surrounding the events of the resurrection, and he writes how stunning this news was to the people who first discovered it. And here's what he says, on the first day of the week, 
Very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing spices they had prepared. It never occurred to them that Jesus would do exactly what he said he would do. And yet they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified, and they bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? Asked the men. He is not here, but he is risen. Jesus is alive. The Bible, first century early historical documents make it clear that the resurrection was not a metaphor. This wasn't just some sort of symbolism. Jesus literally, physically, bodily arose from the grave. If it was a metaphor, friends, we could close up shop and forget even celebrating Easter because God would be dead and Jesus would be a liar. But because Jesus rose from the grave just as he said he would, what it means is is his promises are true. His word is dependable, namely his word and his promises that he on the cross would bear our sin and in the grave would take our sin, take our shame, and take our guilt with him and that he would rise victoriously over all of it. And Jesus did exactly what he said he would do. He rose victorious. Jesus lives and Jesus reigns. Darius says of Daniel's God, he is the living God, verse 26, and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his dominion has no end. The apostle Paul writing in the New Testament says this of Jesus, for this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. During Jesus' crucifixion, evil men mocked him. They scoffed at him. They said things like, what's your name? Who do you say you are? Are you really the king of the Jews? And in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus boldly and loudly proclaims, I am Jesus. My name is above every name. I am the king of kings. and I am the Lord of lords. And everyone will confess that to be so because Jesus reigns. He's not only living, but he has been seated at the right hand of the Father. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus lives, Jesus reigns, and Jesus rescues. Here's what Darius said. He is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. And he rescues and delivers He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth, and he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. In the pit of the lions, God rescues Daniel from death. And Daniel is restored. Here's what the scripture says. When Daniel was brought up from the den, he was found to be unharmed. Don't miss this. For he trusted in his God. Again, Through Jesus, God rescues sinful men and sinful women uh, women from their sin. The Apostle Paul writes this in his opus on the gospel known as Romans. If you, if you and if I confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, you'll be delivered, you'll be rescued. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. That's Romans 10, 9 and 10. I want you to notice a theme that's running all the way from the Old Testament in Daniel's life through the New Testament that frankly runs all the way to today. Here is the implication the Bible makes. It makes this implication that trust brought rescue. 
that trust is essential to salvation, that faith is critical to salvation. Here is the point that we see in the life of Daniel, and here is what the Easter story is telling us, is that you and I, we cannot save ourselves. The trust in ourselves is, uh, is fruitless, is hopeless. We can no more save ourselves from our sin. We can no more give ourselves purpose in this life than Daniel could save himself from the mouths of hungry lions. No, the story is this, is that Jesus has done for you and me what we could not do for ourselves. Namely, he has died in our place. He has taken our sin upon himself. And in, in, in place of our guilt and in place of our shame, he offers us his righteousness. He offers us his goodness. He offers us rescue. That is the story of the gospel. That is the Easter story. Easter is the story of God sending Jesus to rescue us. That is the story of all stories. It is the whole point of the gospel. It's the whole point of this day. And COVID-19, it has certainly changed what's normal in our lives. And I think for many, uh, the, the events of these recent days has caused us to consider our mortality in more significant ways. And this morning, I would like to pose an important question to you. What is your hope in this life and the next? What is it that you are clinging to? What has maybe this moment exposed in your life that you sense that you're missing this Easter? A risen, reigning, and rescuing Jesus invites you to experience life in him. He invites you to leave aside trusting in yourself, hoping in your morality, hoping in your good works, trying to make it through religious exercises. He invites you instead to embrace the fact that he has done for you what you could not do for yourself. He invites you to trust him, to put your hopes for this life and the next squarely on his redemptive work Jesus fulfilled every promise that he said he would fulfill. He accomplished everything that he set out to accomplish. Namely, he did this. He found and made a way for you and I to be in relationship with him. He has found a way for you and I to experience freedom from our sin, freedom from our guilt, freedom from our past, and abundant and eternal life with him. And he has invited us into that. So this morning, I want to invite you into that. I want to encourage you to walk away from trusting in yourself, from hoping that somehow or another you can do enough good to be good enough because we can't. And walk away from that. We call that repentance. And instead, turn and say yes to the invitation that Jesus is offering you. Jesus wants to rescue you from yourself and from sin, and he wants to make you a part of his family This is grace, this is good news, this is what's known as the gospel. And my friends, there is no better day than Easter Sunday 2020 for you to embrace and accept the invitation of Jesus living, reigning, and rescuing life than today. Would you today, through faith, the best way you know how. Trust Jesus in his work for you. We would count it a sacred privilege to help you in that journey. If you've got questions about God, if you've got questions about Christianity, one of our pastors would love to reach out to you, have a conversation with you, and we can do that digitally in this time. Matter of fact, if you would like to take next steps in your walk with Jesus, there's a phone number on your screen and an email address on your screen. All you need to do is text next steps to 865 896 3782 or email us at next steps at fellowshipknox.org. Listen, this is the most important step anyone could take in their life, and we want to be a part of that with you. We want to help you with that. We want to answer questions. But most of all, we want to encourage you to do like Daniel to do like people have done for thousands of years now, 
and that is put trust in Jesus. Hope in Jesus today. No matter what you're facing, no matter what life has sent your way, there is a Savior who loves you. He loved you enough to die in your place. But because he was God, he overcame the grave. He rose victoriously, and he invites you to be part of his family. He invites you to be together with him. And today, we would love for you to take that step. We're going to conclude our Easter worship service in worship, in song. So sing along with us, worship with us, and then you'll hear from Kyle right before we sign off. God bless.